And, and welcome all, all of you uh, here for the Dialogue of Economics and Catholic Social Thought. Our speakers tonight are uh, Joseph Kaboski and Father Martin Schlag. Uh, I'll be moderating the event. Uh, they'll, they'll both be doing most of the, uh, most of the talking, but uh, after they have a chance to make their remarks, um, there'll be an opportunity for, uh, for some questions uh, from yourselves, and I, will, uh, I may be able to uh, ask a few questions myself. Uh, so let me be, uh, begin simply by introducing, um, introducing our, our, our two speakers tonight. Uh, Father Martin Schlag is professor of the Social Doctrine of the Church at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. He holds doctorates in Law and Theology from the University of Vienna. He has recently edited, together with Juan Andres Mercado, Freedom of Markets and the Culture of Common Good. And he'll be speaking uh, first this evening. Uh, responding to his remarks uh, will be Professor Joseph Kaboski who is the David F. and Aaron M. Seng Foundation Associate Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics at the University of Notre Dame. His research focuses on growth, development, international economics, with an emphasis on structural change, finance and development, schooling and growth, microfinance, international relative price patterns, and the role of inventories in international trade. He has consulted for the Federal Reserve Banks of Chicago, Minneapolis, and St. Louis, as well as the World Bank. Uh, please join me in welcoming them. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I feel very honored to be able to speak to you today to, at a university uh, with world renown and also I'm also happy that my brother is here who is professor here at this university. So. Um, let me start my remarks on uh, the relationship between economics and Catholic social thought with three personal stories uh, which I have recently um, had in my own life. The first one is a book uh, written by Michael Sandel of Harvard University uh, called What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. And in it he says, economists don't like gifts. Or to be precise, they have a hard time making sense of gift, of gift giving, as a rational social practice. Unquote. And he then uh, calculates how many billions of dollars, or how many millions of dollars, are used every year, or wasted every year, with gifts which people don't really want to receive. You know, so he said it would be much more rational to just give the money and let people buy what they want. You know, instead of giving them things they don't want. And he says, no, that is not true because uh, gifts are expression of relationships that engage, challenge, and reinterpret our identities. So it discovers a human sense uh, in gifts. Now, anybody who has just heard uh, about Caritas in Veritate, or maybe heard a critique of this last encyclical of Pope Benedict XVI on social issues, might know that the idea of gift is quite prominent in that encyclical. Now, uh, the second personal uh, story I want to tell is uh, Michael Porter in 2011, January 2011, also of Harvard University, published his article, Creating Shared Value, How to Reinvent Capitalism and Unleash a Wave of Innovation and Growth. Probably many you, of you are uh, familiar with this essay. Now, in it, he advocates a new form of economy that is capitalist in essence, but goes beyond the creation of wealth, adding uh, social, positive social effects and ecological sustainability to financial profit. Now, Catholic social teaching has been saying the same thing, th same things, I would say, nearly since Rerum Novarum, nearly since 1891. Third story, in May 2011, I participated in the annual conference of the Transformational Business Network, a, a network of about 400 firms that put capitalism to the service of development in the belief that the economy is not a zero-sum game, but economic growth of the poor is <coughs> of advantage also to the rich and the other way around. Now, <coughs> all, three, all three of these have in common that they contain, uh, that they repeat things which are said by social teaching of the church, especially by the last encyclical of Pope Benedict XVI, but do not even know of its existence. 
Now it seems that the Vatican is not very good at keeping some things secret, as we have seen. But others, however, are effectively silenced, and it's uh, an open joke that the the best kept secret of the Catholic Church is its social teaching, which I think is a pity, because the more I study it, the more I see that it is a very balanced and a very sensible um, teaching. Now I don't I don't know how things are in the, in the United States. But in Europe, people are constantly speaking of crisis. I think it's the, the word which has been repeated most in the media in the last few years. We're in, we're in the middle of a crisis. Um, and usually people say it's, it's a global crisis, a global economic crisis. And uh, well, Neil Ferguson, Niall Ferguson of, of Harvard also says we're at the end of our Western civilization and so on. And I, th I don't think it's, it's really an economic crisis. I think there is a crisis, but I think it is a cultural crisis of the West. And with cultural or with culture, I mean the sum of elements which, which shape our society, which, which make society function well. And something seems to have gone wrong. We, we, we don't have this core of shared values which brings everything back on track. Now, what has gone wrong, or what has gone wrong from the viewpoint of a teacher of uh, Catholic social teaching? Now, <clears throat> I think it would be e too easy for a Catholic teacher to affirm that the church had always taught the correct solution. That is simply not true, you know, uh, because the church doesn't teach solutions. Uh, that is something which, which is continually repeated. We do not offer technical solutions, also because we don't believe that the solution is technical. But uh, in this sense, uh, I think it is healthy to be anti-clerical in a certain sense. You know, uh, Theologians uh, shouldn't talk so much about economics because it can be painful to listen to. To, econ to econ economists. Um, so either we should study more economics or speak less about economics. Um, on, on the other hand, however, I think it would also be too easy to think that the crises of the West were just a technical mistake and once we had got the system fixed, we could just return to business as usual. I, I think the time is ripe and I'm beginning to feel it uh, also in secular um, fields of, of society, that type, the time is ripe for a paradigm shift in business, in the way of doing business. The, the economic crisis is not a mechanical flaw in an otherwise perfect machine. Uh, the cause of the crisis has to do with conceiving the economy as a machine, as mechanics, which function by some technical laws and has nothing to do with ethics or with human relations. Um, I remember the Lumen Christi Institute conference in May. There was a professor of Cornell University, and she said that the majority of her students hold that who lets himself be cheated deserves being cheated. And she says, since 2008, she contradicts. Now, um, what has gone wrong? Uh, well, we, we live in systems which have been called democratic capitalism. Uh, we can also call it social market economy, even though in the state social market economy has a slightly different meaning. But what one calls democratic capitalism in the states would be social market economy or order liberalism in, in Germany. And this system which we live in is in reality a, um, a combination of three subsystems. The political system, the economic system, and the moral cultural system. Each of these systems consists of institutions and values. Take the political system, we have institutions, uh, democratic representation, separation of power, the rule of law, <clears throat> and we have values, uh, self-discipline, self-government, uh, participation, and so on. Then we have the economic system. Institutions would be private property, free markets, the possibility of making profit. And we have values. We have uh, diligence, thrift, uh, initiative, inventiveness, and so on. And then we have the cultural moral system, which uh, 
consist in the institutional level of family, school, university, and churches. And on the value level, we would have all the virtues, the classical virtues of justice, uh, temperance, courage, prudence, wisdom, and so on. Now, the problem with this unity of systems is that the weakest link in this triune system of systems is the moral cultural link, the moral cultural system. Because the success of capitalism destroys the foundations on which it is built. Uh, uh, prosperity and wealth uh, does create the temptation to just live well, you know, and not, well, let's, let's, uh, let's enjoy life, you know, why should I always be working? You know? So, uh, or as Michael Sandel has formulated, markets crowd out morals. Uh, we would have to discuss that, why, why that is the case. Now, <clears throat> what solutions can be, can be found? So, uh, I, I think it is important for these three systems to remain independent on the institutional level. You know, so, in very, it's very obvious that church leaders should not meddle in politics. And in the States, there's no danger, you know, but in the country I come from, in Italy, uh, where I live, I don't come from Italy, but I live in Italy. So, uh, it used to be very common for priests uh, to preach on the Sunday before election day. Uh, well, we're all Democrats, aren't we? Yes. Well, and we're all Christians, aren't we? Yes. So, everybody votes for Democrazia Cristiana, you know, so there was this, uh, this mixture of politics and religion. Um, but also, Government can't create jobs. That is not possible. Because it's not the government's job to create jobs. It's the economy's job to create jobs. But what government can do is it can create the conditions for the economy to be able to create jobs. Because government can only create jobs by using taxpayer money, which they take from the economy. So it, they have to be independent. Um, however, if we regard values, we see we have to distinguish the scientific, the analytical level, from the agency level. Um, let me just uh, take a piece of chalk. If we have the institutional level, we have these three systems. However, if we consider... What's going on? Obama is we have the value level, the circles Let me give you an example. A car producer produces a million cars a year. He has strict quality controls. And in spite of these quality controls, he knows he'll have 50 casualties. And for every casualty, he has to pay $200,000 indemnity. So, even though my brother doesn't teach calculus, I think that is $10. He has to add $10 to every car, okay? Because he has to pay $10 million. Okay. okay, now we could say, does he value human life for $10? No, because this is a purely economic calculation of costs. He has to add these $10 to each car when he sells them. However, he could feel tempted to say, well, uh, why don't I scrap the quality control? It's very, very expensive. I will have 200 casualties, but it still will be cheaper than the quality control. So this would, however, begin to, uh, to touch the overlapping circle with ethics, because this would be against human dignity. Human life has no price, it has dignity. It cannot be measured in money. Uh, and if we consider the human agency, the agent as individual in his, uh, in, the, in his decision, in his action, we see that these overlapping circles of economic behavior and political behavior belong to an overarching circle of ethical behavior. Because each free decision, each of my free decisions, is an ethical decision. Now, I think, of course, if we, say, if we say this, the question is, okay, so who's ethics? You know, I've just come from a conference uh, in Washington where uh, Emita 
uh, Etzioni, Amita Etzioni, the, the founder of communitarianism in, the, in, in economics, said, well, uh, he was professor for ethics at Harvard Business School, and they, they, no professor lasts longer than a year. They, they, they get thrown out. And, and, but they got a 20 million endowment for business ethics, so they said, well, okay, we won't resist this temptation. And, um, and so they had to decide on what to do. So each of the departments said, no, I don't want to have ethics in my lessons because I would have to stop teaching finance. Or I, I would have to stop teaching marketing or I would have to stop teaching whatever, you know. So they decided to have a five-day introduction to ethics. And they teach this way. Uh, Kant says this. Uh, Hegel says that. Aquinas said that. Uh, utilit utilitarians say this, you know. So just kind of they suggest that you just choose your theory to justify what you're doing. You know? um, so it, you, can, you can actually become relativist if you, if you don't teach ethics in a proper way. So um, I think that Christian humanism can make an important contribution to real human flourishing precisely because it transcends the merely imminent goals of the good life. And uh, I think an important distinction is something which uh, Joe tried to teach his children, or tries to teach his children, the, the difference between pleasure and happiness. You know, where only where this distinction is made can there really be ethics. Otherwise, there would exist a mere technical calculus for the maximization of pleasure. Now, um, this is where Catholic social teaching sets in, you know, and I think it is very important for the for regenerating this core of shared values from the viewpoint or from the contribution which Christian humanism can make to society. And well, to tell you the truth, I, I've read everything Pope Benedict has said on economics, or on the economy. And having read it, the sum is, it's not his topic. Okay? <laughs> so he's very strong on other topics. He's great in liturgy, he's great in uh, fundamental theology, but it, it, okay, he's not at ease, he's not at home. In, 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 in economics. However, um, and, and besides the social, the social encyclical of Pope Benedict XVI uh, was received far less enthusiastically than his first encyclical on love. I think it's, it, it isn't surprising. Um, some Catholics, especially in the USA and among business people, have great difficulties understanding it uh, or accepting some of the solutions he offers. For example, creating a true world political authority and stronger international organizations, the spirit of gift and gratuitousness, large-scale redistribution of wealth, the importance given to the environment and to migra migration, etc. You know, you, you, the alarm bells go off. You know? um, yeah, it, it is true. Caritas in Veritate is the longest social encyclical to date and it probably deals with too many topics. I counted 90 topics. Um, however, I do think it deserves more attention than it has received because it, it can unleash a wave of new reflections on the economy. So what I'll try to do is briefly characterize what, the, what nowadays, or in this moment, the official papal Catholic teaching suggests or offers are the new accents giving, given. And I'll, I'll just do that in three general points and then three special points. How many mi minutes do I have left? About 10 minutes. About 10 minutes, my god. Okay. So. The three general points are the social question has become an anthropological question. This is a literal quotation from the encyclical. And um, you will remember that the social question for Reo Novarum, or for the church teaching up to now, was the way workers were treated. 
That was the blatantly unjust way during the Industrial Revolution and so on. That was the social question. So actually, Pope Benedict has refocused the, the social question, the, the, the core question of the social teaching to the anthropological question, which he defines as um, the defending the human person against the onslaught of technology. So we, we always, we, we, we know very well how the human body works. We know very well how things function, also socially. But we don't know who the human person is and what, for, what we do things for, why we do things. You know? So this, the, this, the anthropological sense. The, the second point is, um, I'm not going to write the whole quotation, but he says, the church's social doctrine or teaching came into being in order to claim citizens, citizen state, citizenship status for the Christian religion. Citizenship status. For the Christian religion. Now, uh, John Paul II underscored or underlined the fact that the social teaching of the Catholic Church was not a third path between collectivism and individualism. And he said, no, that it is theology. Why did he do that? Because on one hand he wanted to avoid the idea that the Catholic social teaching were a political program which uh, people in the West or Christian parties could immediately use as their political program and say, we are the Catholic or Christian party. Uh, and on the other hand, he wanted to exonerate the people in communist countries uh, from the accusation that they were kind of subject to foreign political powers. He said, no, no, look, this is what we teach. This is not politics. This is theology. Now, Pope Benedict doesn't do that anymore. Of course, he does say that uh, we, the, the Catholic social teaching is based on revelation, but he always says faith and reason, faith and natural law, revelation and natural law. It's all this, this is the old duplex ordo cognitionis, the double order of, of, of knowledge, of cognizance uh, in theology. And of course, this whole thing also has to do with a paradigm shift in the way the church understands herself and her relationship with society. Now, in, in the 19th century, the view was a top-down view. The, the, the church wanted to have concordats with friendly states, with, state, with friendly sovereigns, and they would then enact laws which would implement the, the social teaching of the church. Now, this has changed. Now, the church says, uh, following the American experience of uh, religious freedom, no, lay people, Catholics, Christians, follow your conscience, use the, the, the open space in society created by the civic liberties given by the liberal constitutions. So this would be meant by citizen status in, uh, for the Christian religion. And the third point is, the, he says, Politics is the institutional path of charity. Institutional path of charity. Now, this too is, is a big innovation because uh, traditionally, there, we, the uh, Catholic teaching has a blind spot for the importance of institutions. I can't even sketch why this is the case or how this is the case. It has to do with, the, uh, with natural law and with the idea that you could deduce from the nature of a state or of a society uh, laws or rules for its functioning. This can work well if you apply it to the human person because we're all astoundingly uniform. I mean, we're all different, but we all have a body, we all have a soul, we all have passions. We all, I mean, it's always the same thing, you know? Uh, so we, 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 and we have basic needs, we, we want to flourish, we want to be happy, we want to pursue happiness. Uh, but if, we, if, if you apply this to a state, it, or to government, or to society, it easily becomes ideological. 
And actually, we, uh, there, there was a period of nostalgia, of nostalgia for the Middle Ages, of going back to a cooperative system, uh, and a, 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 a lack of comprehension for the importance of the American experience, of the institutions, uh, the necessity for checks and balances, of separation of powers, and so on. You know? and, and unfortunately, for instance, in, in 1933, when Hitler uh, came to power, the Christian party in the German uh, parliament voted for Hitler because Hitler had given the Catholics the Concordat and he said, I'm fighting the communists, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have the Catholic schools, um, but you must give me the parliament, you must give me independent judges, you, uh, uh, there will only be one party, so, and they didn't have this, this feeling, this comprehension of, for the importance of institutions. Okay, these are the, the, the three innovations or the three new accents in a general sense which uh, um, now have been kind of communicated. Now, the, the three points of special interest uh, which have to do with, with the economy. Uh, the first one is that the Pope says, uh, listen guys, don't believe Max Weber. Max Weber who said uh, in his famous article on the... the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, that capitalism is a consequence of Calvinism. Because what he, his argument was that uh, Calvinists believe in predestination, so either you're predestined for heaven or you're predestined for hell, and that is uh, unchangeable. So what, there's nothing you can do, so all uh, the ascetic energy uh, which Christianity had produced was applied to earthly aims. Now, that's the argument of Max Weber, you know. But it simply isn't true historically, uh, because capitalism was born in paleo-Catholic, uh, paleo-capitalist systems of northern Italy in the 13th century, in the 14th century, uh, where these instruments of finance and so on were um, were developed, and. Uh, of course, we have to admit that for centuries there has existed what one might call a Catholic antagonism toward economics, finance, money, and so on. You know, um, especially this is especially the case in Europe. If, if uh, I have a student who, whom I asked, uh, he's uh, uh, forty or fifty. I ask him, oh, "Where do you work?" And he said, "Oh, I'm sorry. I have to apologize." I work in finance. And they said, "No, no worry. It's, you, know, you won't get dirty, you know, because you work in finance." But this is this mentality is still quite strong in Europe or in, in Italy. Um, now, it, uh, I just want to point out that it was the Franciscan school of the 14th and the 15th centuries, and the school of Salamanca of the 16th century that laid the foundations not only for a new understanding of the economic activity in the church, but also for the beginning of the modern science of economics. It is correct what Schumpeter says, that the basic concepts of modern economic thought were formed during the scholastic period and reached Adam Smith and modern economics through the works of late scholasticism, which come nearer than does any other group to having been the founders of scientific economics, unquote. Um, yeah, I always think it's kind of a paradox that the friars who had made the vow of poverty invented uh, accountancy. You know, they weren't allowed to have money. So what they did is they gave it to a amicus spiritualis, to a spiritual friend. And this spiritual friend had to use the money uh, to maintain the monastery. So these were the first managers. And of course they had to, they were accountable, so they invented accountancy. Um, and these, these uh, friars, they were in contact with the poor people, and they realized that the canonical prohibition of any form of interest uh, was negative, it was counterproductive, because these, uh, the, the, these medium, small and medium enterprises, had to take loans at an incredible interest rate. 
So uh, what they did is they created the Montes Pietatis, the, the, these, the first social banks, and gave loans for five or four or five percent interest and um, helped the small and medium enterprises. You know, so microfinance was not invented by Mohammed Yunus but by the Franciscans in the in in, in the 40, in, in 1462 the first social bank opened. Okay, in order, I, I'll just, I, I can't avoid, avoid quote in this room where uh, Milton Friedman uh, taught, uh, to quote something from Plato. Uh, Plato says, um, I would perhaps put the death penalty on anyone who says, business is business, and therefore business has nothing to do with justice. He says that in, in his, uh, in Nomoi. And um, this is the second point which Pope Benedict uh, makes. He says, we have to overcome the methodological fragmentation which has taken place in modern economics. Um, now, uh, you know there, there is a, the, the big gap uh, which opened with Adam Smith. Adam Smith um, applied Newtonian, the Newtonian conception of natural sciences to social sciences. And he was also influ influenced by Leibniz's idea of a pre-stabilized harmony. You know? And what he did is he changed the method used by the scholastics, which was a prescriptive method, telling people what they had to do to be just in their work as uh, uh, economists, to describing what was going. He became descriptive. So there's, a, there's this big, this great gap between the the two. And, well, I don't have time to, to go into this, but more or less, I think, I, I, I tried to explain what I think in, in, these, uh, in, in these diagrams. Um, and then the, the last big challenge of Pope Benedict, and that is the real novelty, is how can we introduce charity into the economy, you know? Charity is at the heart of the church's social doctrine. It is the principle not only of micro relationships with friends, with family members, or within small groups, but also of macro relationships, social, economic, and political ones. You know, and uh, this is a challenge because it's difficult to say how can we do that. You know, I don't. I don't really have a clear answer. Uh, my answer would be that we need the virtues to react flexibly to the to the needs and the changes in society in order to balance freedom on one hand and responsibility and the love of the, of the common good on the other hand. If God is dead, what are the churches but the graves and tombs of God? Was what Nietzsche asked. God is not dead. No. Uh, man has an unquenchable thirst for truth, for good and for freedom. The tempting models of materialism are fading and man is again on the search for something more spiritual. He has become a riddle to himself. Science, wealth, technical progress have not satisfied his thirst for happiness. God is not dead. He will return to our schools, our universities, and also to our minds and to our senses when we come to our senses. Thank you very much. Um, let me apologize in advance for a couple of things. One is uh, I plan on having a visual talk, and, which I won't have because um, there's not an overhead machine. And um, the other is um, I didn't know I was supposed to necessarily discuss, respond to uh, Father. Uh, so I'm kind of going to talk about related things, but from the point of view mainly of an economist. Um, I agreed with a great deal of what uh, Father Schlag had to say. This may we can get to a little bit over in the discussion period, but uh, I wanted to start um, by... Father was good enough to start writing things. I like this picture and we'll have to come <laughs> Distinguish four terms. Father talked about the nature of Catholic social teaching. 
And I want to distinguish four terms that other people are necessarily familiar, and this may all get mucked up and people say. First is social justice. My hand running is horrible too. Um, the next is Catholic social doctrine or principles. The, th the, th the one, two, three. The third is uh, Catholic social thought. <coughs> and the fourth is Catholic social teaching. I think of these as all as distinct concepts, obviously related. The distinct concepts, and it's important to understand the distinction between the two. Let me take social justice. Social justice um, is um, perhaps the, well, let's see here. Okay. Um, maybe that's the term we're the most familiar with, but probably have the least understanding of. So I think if you're somebody that's on the left, you think of social justice as anything that's kind of, um, anything that's a concern for the poor, Anything about redistribution? And maybe if you're somebody on the right, you think of social justice as being just an empty term to sort of justify any sort of left-leaning politics or something. Yeah. Okay? And both of those are, are, are false. And the reason is that if social justice is a very important part of Catholic social doctrine, um, so I don't want, I, so I want to make sure we understand it, but it doesn't encompass the fullness of Catholic social doctrine. So to, to know what social justice is, the first thing you have to know is what a virtue is. And this is like maybe catechism class, a virtue is a habit or an orientation or an attitude that sort of um, orient, I guess I'm using the word in the definition. It's a habit or attitude or a disposition that orientates us toward God or the good, okay? Justice is a particular virtue. Justice is a virtue that orients us toward giving others what they're due what they're rightly do. Social justice is a particular type of justice. It's when we strive that institutions, institutions and culture and social relationships are oriented toward giving others their due, okay? That's a very important part of Catholic social thought, but it's not by any means the fullness of Catholic social thought. The first thing you can see already, we talked about politics being the institutional path to charity. Well, social justice may be the institutional path to justice, but it leaves out completely charity, right? So caritas and veritate, the point of the encyclical, the heart of the encyclical would be left out of this term, social justice, okay? Second, Catholic social doctrine. I'm a big fan of Catholic social doctrine. Um, Catholic social doctrine, I want to distinguish Catholic social doctrine and Catholic social thought. Catholic social doctrine is sort of the eternal part it's at the heart of Christianity. It's, a, it's not something that was invented in 1891, and it's not an optional part of being a Christian. It's essential to a Christian. If you go to the core principles, they come from the idea of personhood. We talked about Christian anthropology, about love, justice. Love and justice are the, the, the focus. Understanding the human person, who we are, who God is, why we're here, what good relationships mean between us and God and us and other people. This is at the heart of, of, of Christianity. Dates back to the Bible, through tradition, going back into the Old Testament. A great deal of them come from the first and second chapter of Genesis, in fact. So it's right at the beginning of our religion. So it's not something dispensable. Okay, this is the eternal part. What's Catholic social thought? We're part of a living tradition. Christianity is, right? So we have this eternal, it, it's, it's um, it's closely, the, the interaction between these two are close to the, the living tradition of the church. What's the living tradition of the church? Some people either want to emphasize the living part of the tradition, that things can change. Some people like to emphasize the tradition part, that things are eternal. But the living tradition is, is we have this deposit of faith, this revelation in Christ Jesus that's passed on faithfully, but it's passed on dynamically and it's reapplied constantly and renewed in our lives. Okay, so that's the living part. And Catholic social thought is taking these, these social principles that are at the heart of our faith and reapplying them to 
the changing social <laughs> questions of the day, the changing circumstances, okay, all these things. So, by nature, this is not changing. This is changing. This has got to be more provisional. This can be, the, you know, the Catholic social thought in the United States in 2012 has got to be different than what it was in the feudal time period. The last one is Catholic social teaching. Catholic social teaching refers to sort of the magisterial documents, the popes and the bishops. Um, the modern Catholic social teaching dates back to Leo, 1891. The Catholic social teaching's gone on before that. Um, and Catholic social teaching, again, the heart of it is theology, right? It's not, a, it's not an economic program, like Father said. Uh, so we're trying to take theology and apply it to social issues today, to ethics. Uh, why do I say this? When you read a document, it has these eternal principles. Why does the church teach the same things? If we've, if, why do we keep reminding us of the same principles over time? One is to, make, to correct errors. The other is to remind us of how we should be applying these things to the, to the changing circumstances. When you, when you read policy prescriptions, uh, Father Schlag also already mentioned the church doesn't say that it has any technical expertise. It doesn't offer policy prescriptions, right? It does apply Catholic social doctrine to today, but it but that's not the heart of what's going on in the teaching, okay? So if you go back to I don't know if you know Aquinas language, this is the University of Chicago where what is it, uh, Jewish professor, atheist professors, Jewish professors teach atheist students Catholic theology in a Baptist <laughs> university or something. So maybe you've all taken Aquinas, but you know, this accidents versus essence, okay? The essence is never changing. The accidents are changing all the time. But if you're reading Catholic social thought, Catholic social teachings as political or economic programs, you're missing the essence. You're focusing on the accidents rather than the essence. Another part, is when you see these mixtures, and the church doesn't always distinguish these things as well as I would like them to, but the authority of the church is obviously much stronger on the eternal than on the policy prescription. Some of this is very provisional. I mean, that's the Catholic social thought part. Um, so, um, <coughs> so you don't want to read them as, as policy. I mean, otherwise, you get, you get caught in, a fundam in almost a political fundamentalism that says, what was taught in 1891 has to be true to today in terms of particular policies, and an example would be usury. Economic circumstances have completely changed, and with it, the church's views and the development of doctrine in, in terms of usury have changed. Okay. Um, so where does economics fit into all this? The church, again, is an expert in man, not in social science. They emphasize all the time that there's no technical expertise, Father did a good thing, and in fact, sometimes there's a little bit of an animosity towards economics. But if you read the Catholic social, you know, the documents, there is an understanding of different spheres. There's not, there's a role for economics and the other social scientists. In fact, we, especially as Catholics, are called, well, everyone is called, to provide our expertise to address these social questions. And in part, a lot of the questions of morality of things, um, the, the, the social doctrine and the principles are important, but understanding the economics of outcomes is also important. So the morality of policies, for example, depend on what outcomes they produce often. Um, so why else? Why, why else do we th see a role for economics? There's no conflict between faith and reason. There's no conflict between the church and science. They both have God as their author. Um, each one of the things that Pope mentions, and, and, and uh, Father Schlag alluded to it, is that this, the, the unity of the human person is sort of lost as we become specialized. And I think there, it's not an argument against the specific fields, but it's against the specific fields having complete hegemony or a complete picture of the human person. So every, you know, homo economicus is a view of man that may be valid, but it's not the full view of man, okay? Um, may not always be valid either, but, but the church understands that economics plays a role. Um, they also em emphasize that economics and any social science is not sort of value free. So we always have a duty to the moral order. All of human life has a duty to the moral order. Okay, 
Let me give you a practical um, example. I want to go over two, two practical examples where Catholic social thought and economics can kind of interact. First is the church from these principles is derived two concepts. One is the right to work and the other is the right to a just wage. The right to work um, is, it comes from one of the key principles in Catholic social thought is the universal destination of the earth's goods. That everyone ought to be able to, through their own work, earn a living for themselves from the goods of the earth that God has given us. Uh, not only for themselves, but for their family. The second is we have a right to use, this comes from human dignity, we have a right to use our gifts for the service of others and, and to develop our own virtue, so for our own self-fulfillment and for the, the service of others. And so if people don't have the right to work, they don't have the right to put their, their gifts to work, they don't have the right to earn a living from the land, okay? So there's a right to work. The second is the, uh, a right to a just wage. So, and it stems from many of the same principles. Again, you go to the universal destination of your goods, it's not enough that I be allowed to work, it's also that I ought to be able to earn enough to sustain myself and my family f from working. Okay, so that, that's the, uh, again, the universal destination of the earth's goods. A second aspect, which goes back to human dignity and the human freedom, is that in order for a wage to be just, it has to be sufficient, but it also has to be free of fraud or, or uh, usury, or, uh, fraud or force, enslavement, all these types of things, okay? So you have these two principles, the right to a just wage and the right to work. And then the question is, is there any tension between these two. Um, in, in some ways, the principles themselves, I think, are pretty clear. Most people agree with them. If you, re if you watched the debate between Obama and Romney, actually, I didn't watch it, so I'm going to make this up. But I, <laughs> my guess is they didn't agree on much. But I'm sure that they, they both wanted low unemployment and high wages, OK? So this is not a question necessarily in this particular of a conflict in ethics in the, you know, in the, the normative side. It's a question necessarily of what, what's the best policy to achieve what we want and how do we weight these two, maybe. Um, so, okay, so, so I think that here's where economics can play a role. Um, the idea of a just wage is a long, Tradition, actually, what was a just wage was argued about by a lot of people. The Salamancan fathers um, talked about just prices, just wages. The Catholic social thought has decided on this idea that it needs to be enough to provide for your family. Um, um, how has this typically been understood by people? People have thought of this as being minimum wages. So the way to make sure that people are, can earn a living through their work is to set minimum wages. And economics has studied minimum wages a great deal. There's a lot of empirical work, theoretical work on this. When you go to the most basic economic theory, this is the law of demand. If the cost of something goes up, you demand less of it, okay? So if you raise the wage for low-skilled workers, employers are gonna hire less, skill, le less of those low-skilled workers, okay? So here's a tension which is if we raise the wage to try to hit the just wage, do we cause more unemployment and violate the right to a just wage? And economists can say something about that. So one, one question is if you just look, what is income? Income is hours, how much you work, times your wages. There's a basic question, which is if the wage goes up and the hours go down, what actually happens to the total income that a person makes, okay? Um, so economists have asked sort of three questions that are important to this. The first is, do minimum wages lower employment opportunities for less skilled workers? So is this the case, okay? The second is, do minimum wages increase the earnings of less skilled workers? So what's this? Okay. This is presumably the target, the less skilled workers. But then the finally is, do minimum wages increase the earnings of poor families? Since the point of the just wage is to help people provide for their families. And the answers to these questions, do minimum wages lower uh, the employment? This one is yes. The 
it, lower, it lowers, uh, it increases unemployment. What about income? Income, um, this is no, actually goes down slightly, but it's not a big deal. The big deal is for the people that get jobs and don't get jobs. If you get a job at a minimum wage, you, you're doing better. If you didn't get a job, you're in bigger trouble than you were before. And the final one is do minimum wages increase the earnings of poor families? And there the answer is no. It has very little effect on the earnings of poor families. The reason and this distinction between does it, earn the, does it raise the earnings of low-skilled workers and it does it raise the income of poor families is that it's almost a, it seems almost impossible, but it's true if you think about it for a second, which is that most low-wage earners aren't in poor families. Does that make sense? Who are mainly, low-wage earners are distributed fairly evenly across the income spectrum, right? Who are low-wage earners? When I was 16 years old, I worked at the York Steakhouse. My family wasn't a low income, but I wasn't a low, wasn't a poor family, but I was a low income earner, okay? So only 13% of low-wage earners are in poor families. 46% are in families that are earning over three times the poverty line, okay? Workers affected by the minimum wage are distributed fairly evenly across the income distribution. I mentioned that already. And the, this is the kicker. Many families that are below the poverty line, looking at poor families, they're below the poverty line not because their wages low, but because they can't get enough hours. They can't work full time. So if you were to take their wage and multiply it by full time work, they would be above the poverty line. Okay. So this is telling us that the policy that was supposed to have had good benefits isn't leading to the results that we wanted. So this is a problem if we think of, again, Catholic social thought and Catholic social teaching as static. Leo had a, a, a view of a just wage, and I think he probably had a minimum wage in mind. Pius the, um, Pius the 11th, 40 years later, said, well, look, we don't even have to think about a wage contract. What we'd rather be doing is actually having some sort of a partnership where things aren't governed by a wage contract. So we know it doesn't, that a just outcome is just remuneration. It doesn't have to work through a minimum wage. Pope John Paul said there's all sorts of other ways we can do this. We can think about grants to poor families. One of the things economists have come up with is called the earned income tax credit. That's an alternative way of subsidizing the earnings of poor families. How does this work? If you earn $10 an hour for the first X hours you make, the government subsidizes your wage. So you might, in, instead of work making $7.25, which is the minimum wage, if you have three kids, you might be making $12 an hour for those first, for the, you know, until you, you know, for, for several hours, okay? As the income goes up, it's phased out. So it becomes a subsidy for people to work at low incomes. So you get more work and more earnings for the poor. Eventually that gets, saved up, um, that gets phased out, but it increases employment rather than reducing it. It has an ambiguous effect on hours because, uh, again, people that aren't working are induced to work, but people that had a lot of hours, eventually it gets phased out, so it becomes a tax, and so it lowers your wage on the margin there. Um, but here's the, but so it seems like a good policy on those two fronts. Nothing is a free lunch, well, maybe not nothing, but many things in life aren't free lunches. There's costs of it. One is the earned income tax credit, costs about $50 billion, it's something that people have no matter which uh, parties had, had a, um, held the presidency, earned, earned income tax credit has increased over time from 1970s when it was introduced. Um, what does that do though? That's part of when, when Romney says 47% of people aren't paying taxes. Many of those people are earning the in, earned income tax credit. So we're not paying taxes, we're actually getting paid negative taxes. Okay, so that's a cost, it costs the government money. The second thing is there's a lot of corruption. One third of the people that claim the earned income tax credit don't qualify for it. And so that's always a problem. So, you know, this is kind of a, 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 an example of where economics can kind of play a role in these discussions. I want to go over, how much time do I have? Uh, Zero minutes? We're starting to run short on time, so uh, if, if you can wrap up maybe in the next couple of minutes, that would give a little bit of time for comments and questions. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. All right. So I didn't have the pictures anyway. Here's what I want to say. 
Another, another thing is um, we hear often is uh, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Okay? That's somewhat true in the United States. If we look at a global level, that's not true at all. Uh, everyone is getting richer is the first thing. The second thing is, what is the economic disparity rising in the, in the world? If you look at the number of countries, there are more rich countries today, fewer middle-income countries, and more poor countries. But if you look at the number of bodies, two of the middle-income countries happen to have a billion people in them each. One of them's China, one of them's India. They've become middle-income over the past 20 years because of high growth. Why do I say this? Well, if you look at dis economic disparities within the United States or within Europe, you have a, a, a warped perspective on what poverty means. It, they, the poor people in developing countries are living on a, a, a couple dollars a day. Even countries we think of as poor as Catholics, Mexico, Brazil, they're middle-income countries. Um, if you're in Africa, you know, a couple dollars a day is what people live on. Um, so there's this idea of kind of just informing people of these thinking about global solidarity versus local solidarity. How do policies affect the, the, the truly poor in the world versus the, you know, the poor in this country? Uh, and what, you know, once we realize how deep these poverties are in the rest of the world, how is, do we as Christians respond? Um, these are all uh, big questions. Let's see uh, if I had any other points. Well, just to sum up then. Catholic social doctrine is an essential part of the Christian faith. Our faith requires constantly reapplying these to changing times. If we're going to have a, a faith that's alive, it has to be active in our life. It has to be reapplied to the world. That's a Catholic social thought. This needs, requires a discussion with economics. Economics needs ethics. Ethics needs economics. Policies usually face trade-offs, and they sometimes face unintended consequences. I'm not sure if it's because I'm a University of Chicago economist that I believe that, or if it's because I'm a Catholic, but I'm very suspicious of two things. One is when there's too many free lunches lying around, when there's too many win-win situations, I'm skeptical as an economist. As a Catholic, when I'm told that loving your neighbor means it's good for both of you, it doesn't require sacrifice, any understanding of love that doesn't require sacrifice or suffering uh, doesn't sit well with me. And I think these two remarkably kind of meet that of often policies aren't win-win situations. Businessmen can't always increase their profits by doing good things. Sometimes they just have to sacrifice their profits to do good things. Um, Poverty is a huge issue. <coughs> things are improving. In the past 20 years, actually, I imagine Obama and uh, Romney also talked a lot about China. And we thought of China as being maybe an enemy. They're taking all our jobs and all this sort of thing. What you have to realize is in the past 20 years, more people have been lifted out of extreme poverty in these past 20 years than in the history, any 20 year period in the history of the world. So when we think of an economic crisis, we have to think, well, maybe there's an economic crisis going on right now in the United States, but in China, there's an economic miracle going on. That doesn't, maybe it leads to a great deal of pleasure, maybe material benefits. That doesn't necessarily mean it leads to happiness, but I think we should appreciate that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you both, uh, Father Schlag and Professor uh, Kaboski. We, um, we have a few minutes left here, and I, I'll, I'll apologize for uh, uh, giving an incorrect preview of, of your remarks. I, I think it was a Freudian slip, uh, because I, uh, I probably wanted to, to offer some responses myself. So I'll, I'll just give a few comments on, on my own, kind of a follow-up, not, not even a response necessarily, but a follow-up to, to a couple of things that each of the, each of the speakers um, mentioned. Uh, one. One is kind of a, a personal anecdote, uh, which is, you know, the question was raised, does the success of capitalism undermine the moral foundations of capitalism? And there's a sense in which the fixation on profit and economic activity might lead us to make sacrifices uh, with respect to our moral character. Uh, we might uh, begin to cut corners ethically. Uh, in ways that uh, have been highly publicized you know, with scandals and events in, in the, in the uh, economic uh, uh, arena of our economy. I think the answer is it doesn't have to. 
Okay, the success of capitalism doesn't have to undermine the moral foundations for capitalism. It's certainly the case that capitalism cannot succeed if people are, are unable to trust each other. There's this idea that capitalism and things like, like trust and reliance on concepts of community and, and, na and, and neighborhood uh, go hand in glove because you can't engage in widespread, high stakes contractual relationships if you don't have some sense of trust in your neighbor. And that sense of trust doesn't necessarily have to be undermined. And the, the example I have in mind is in, in my practice experience. I practiced law for several years before returning to, to the academy. And what I found was that contrary to the, to the, um, uh, to the way lawyers are often portrayed in, in, in jokes and so forth, um, it's a very ethical uh, profession. Most lawyers take their ethics very seriously and believe in, in basic uh, decency. And what you see is uh, I had a friend at my law firm who was extremely ambitious. His goal was basically to, to make a lot of money in life. Uh, but what he learned very quickly was in order to get ahead in the line of work he was in, at least at the firm that I worked and with the clients we had, he had to treat people well, right? He had to, he had to respect other people. He had, he had to treat people, in, you know, they talk about treating people as, as um, ends in themselves rather than means trying to, to take advantage of other people, trying to go around other people's backs, all these things that we see as unethical behavior, um, he realized very quickly that that was a dead end professionally. And so I think one of the things we can take away from this is that in each of our environments, whether it's in a school environment, in a work environment, you know, we have an ability to contribute to a culture. And if that culture says, if somebody tries to take advantage of somebody, if somebody tries to cut corners, they're going to be held back professionally, right? Then the economic order and the moral order can reinforce each other rather than, rather than being at odds. And I'm happy to say, I'm proud to say, as, as a person who, who practiced uh, uh, a law, who was a member of a, a much reviled profession, that in my experience, um, that is what I found was the case. Um, that the, the sense of, of decency and of, of ethical uh, conduct um, was, was self-reinforcing. But that, that only happens if there are enough individuals that the environment is one in which everybody feels that, that pressure and that compulsion. And it's clear, of course, that that's not true with, in every company and in every, in every environment. And that's exactly why we, we face this sense of crisis that Father Schlag uh, mentioned earlier. Okay, so uh, I know we're running uh, short on time, so I'd, I'd love to also make a comment about this too, but I don't want to be long-winded. If anyone has questions uh, for our speakers today, I, I, I'd welcome them.